Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Stoa. I am Peter Limberg, the steward of the Stoa. And the Stoa is a digital campfire for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And today, my friend Adam Robert, who runs the, the Side View, which is um, an independent publisher in media environment that integrates theory and practice while running parallel to academic and public conversations. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to hand it to Adam. He's going to give a 15-20 minute talk on uh, philosophy uh, and death and dying, um, or the philosophy, the practice of death and dying. Uh, and then we're going to do some Q&As. I'll warm up Adam with some questions. And uh, how the Q&A is going to work is, if you have a question for Adam, just write it in the chat box. Um, and then I'll unmute you and then call your name and then you read your question to Adam. Or if you want me to read it on your behalf, just put your name there, indicate that somehow, and I'll read it on your behalf. All right. So, uh, Adam, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, looks like we got a good group. Uh, I'm assuming you can all hear me OK, but just signal somehow if, if I'm not coming across. Doing good? OK. So um, I wanted to start. Um, maybe we can just take a few moments to gather ourselves and collect our attention together. So feel free to close your eyes or just sit still and let yourself catch up to wherever you are right now. And I invite you to relax and take a deep breath. And let's find just a little bit of silence together. Okay, thank you. So what I wanna to do today is offer you some concepts and ideas that come out of Western traditions of contemplation and philosophy that I think may aid us in navigating the times ahead. So I'll say a little bit about practice in general, and then I wanna talk about a few texts. Um, namely, I'm gonna talk about Plato's uh, Dialogue, The Phaedo, and I'm also gonna talk about Pierre Hadot and his reading of philosophy as a spiritual exercise. Uh, I haven't developed all of these ideas as much as I'd like to just yet, so I'm hoping that we can have a little discussion afterwards and maybe unfold these themes a little bit further. Um, I'll also post a list of the texts I'm using in the talk if anyone wants to follow up on them later. Uh, but as a sort of preamble to this discussion, uh, I was recently reminded of a passage in Thomas Merton's book, Contemplative Prayer, which I think might help us orient, orient ourselves a little bit before we begin. He, he makes this really helpful distinction in this text between what he calls a charismatic monastic spirit and an institutional monastic spirit. Um, the institutional spirit is driven by like structures and history and rules and it's more authoritarian and it's a little bit rigid and it uh, has a kind of ascetic nature to it. Um, but the charismatic spirit, he says, is, is rooted more in, in compassion and care and prayer. But it also has this interesting quality of, of operating outside of monasteries and institutions. It has a kind of, it's more of like a, a this worldly kind of practice. Um, and Merton is, is, he's really clear that both types of monasticism are really important. You can't, you can't do too much with, without one or the other. But he says that the, the charismatic type is unusual in that it flourishes in what he calls offbeat situations. And so this is a spirit that grows out of people who may not even have explicit monastic connections at all. 
Um, so I kind of feel like we're living in one of these offbeat situations right now. And so Merton's invocation of this kind of offbeat monasticism felt like the right attitude to adopt um, both in my life and practice right now, but also in this, in this kind of discussion, right? This is a very unusual kind of virtual campfire gathering sort of talk um, on the internet here. So uh, I've been feeling a little bit like an offbeat monastic and um, I have a feeling like we all might be off mate might be offbeat monastics for, for a little bit, for a little while longer here. Um, so I just, I liked that framing for the talk in general. Um, but when I talk about philosophical and contemplative practice, uh, I often use this word ascesis, which just means exercise or training uh, to describe a process where we undergo some kind of change in our being, some kind of transformation and especially a change in our perception. And so ascesis is the root of words like ascetic or asceticism. And so when you think of ascetic practice, uh, you might think of things like fasting or celibacy, physically enduring trials, or maybe, maybe this image of a monk living in isolation. Uh, but it also includes things like meditation and prayer, uh, practices of care and caring, uh, visionary experiences, so either sort of contemplative visionary experiences or psychedelic visionary experiences, um, or also just like kind of examinations of conscience, like sort of daily rituals of examination and, um, and, uh, and practice. Uh, what connects all of these different practices, though, is that they, they have this function of working on our inner and outer senses, and they modify them, right? And on one level, they they change the physical senses, so our, our senses of, of touch, smell, sight, sound, things like that. But on another and probably even more important one, these are practices that um, change our moral sensibilities and intuitions, uh, our intellectual vision of things, uh, our sense of spirit and the spiritual, um, and our psychological maturity as people. So they're kind of like developmental exercises in that sense. And so when we look at perception from the perspective of practice, we can see that there's a kind of a deep connection between our moral and our spiritual lives and our epistemology or our ability to know things. Um, and so I just wanna mark that connection between, between practice and knowing um, just as a theme that I'm gonna come back to a little bit later on. Um, but for now, I wanna focus on a particular practice uh, it's a practice that we find in Plato's text, the Phaedo, um, and it has to do with a certain reading of philosophy as a preparation for death. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, the dialogue, the Phaedo, uh, famously recounts the last hours of Socrates' life before his own death. And so just to set the scene a little bit, um, this, the dialogue starts off, um, Phaedo is talking, he's narrating these last moments. Um, and this is just after um, Socrates has been sentenced to death uh, for impiety and for corrupting the youth of Athens, um, essentially for refusing belief in the official gods, the gods of the state. Um, in these last moments, he's surrounded by friends. Um, it's a very kind of tender scene and they're but they're also it, it kind of still engaged in these deep philosophical discussions about the nature of life and death, death and rebirth, uh, what is the true aim of philosophy, um, the relationship between time and change and eternity, um, and all kinds of other sort of rich topics like this. Um, but I wanted to read just a short excerpt from the dialogue. Um, and this scene is, uh, again, Phaedo just kind of giving his narration of Socrates in these last hours. Um, and this is how Phaedo describes Socrates. And this, this kind of sets up the, the attitude that I want to look at. And so here's Phaedo. He says, I certainly found being there an astonishing experience. Although I was witnessing the death of one who was my friend, I had no feeling of pity for the man appeared happy in both manner and words, as he died nobly and without fear. 
it struck me that even in going down to the underworld, he was going down with the God's blessing and that he would fare well when he got there, if anyone does. That is why I had no feeling of pity, such as would seem natural in my sorrow, nor indeed of pleasure, as we engaged in phys- philosophical discussions as we were accustomed to do, for our arguments were of that sort. But I had a strange feeling, an unaccustomed mixture of pleasure and pain at the same time as I reflected that he was about to die. So this image of Socrates going to his death nobly, without fear, seemingly unperturbed. He's almost casual about the whole thing. This, this is the kind of mood that I want to focus on um, and just ask kind of like, what's going on here? How did, how, did, how did he get to this place? How did Socrates become this kind of person? Um, and I think elsewhere in the dialogue, he has a, he has a very famous passage that um, I'm also going to share with you in a second um, that, that I think gives you some hints into how Socrates is able to approach his own death with this kind of equanimity, with this kind of balance. And so in this famous passage, Socrates himself says, I am afraid that other people do not realize that the one aim of those who practice philosophy in the proper manner is to practice for death and dying. And so I think we can find some answers to these questions here. The simple one is that Socrates approaches his death the way he does because of the way he practices philosophy. And so I think it's worth putting a bit of a microscope on what are these practices exactly? What is he, what is he doing? How did, how did, at the end of his life, how did he reach this place? Um, and so I want to look at some of those practices a little bit more specifically. Um, but I also want to call attention again to our context right now. Um, just to point out, I'm always at pain, pains to point out that when we're talking about these practices, we're putting them into words and the practices themselves aren't necessarily about the words. And it's really easy to, um, especially in a set- setting like this, move into a place where we, we kind of replace practice with this whole discourse about practice. So I'm going to give you a little discourse about practice whilst keeping in mind that the practice is actually what matters. So this phrase, uh, practices for death and dying, uh, that Socrates uses, um, it's its own whole genre of ascesis or ascetic practice. And it falls within a group of practices um, that um, philosophers call melite thanato. Melite thanato. And melite uh, just means to study or to meditate. Um, and the modern term uh, meditation is actually a Latin translation of this Greek word melite. Uh, thanato, um, some of you may know, just means death or to die or to be dying. So melite thanato means meditations on death. Now, these practices aren't all as literal as they sound, um, and instead they circle several different kinds of death that include physical death, but also include all kinds of other notions of death. And so one place where I go to to kind of unpack these practices is Pierre Hadot's work. And if you haven't read Hado, and if you're interested in practice and contemplation and things like that, I really recommend that you pick up, um, he has one book called What is Ancient Philosophy? Um, and another one, which is a collection of essays called Philosophy as a Way of Life. Um, and these are just fantastic studies in philosophical practice, uh, philosophy as spiritual exercise, as he says. So Hado picks up this theme of melite thanato, um, and I'll focus just on the Platonic tradition, just because that's that's what we've been talking about in the Phaedo. Um, so there we saw it already with uh, Phaedo's description of of Socrates' actual death. So um, 
in the scene just prior to Socrates dying, um, Phaedo talks about how uh, Socrates is actually washing his own, his body. He's bathing his body. He's cleaning himself. And this is something that, um, you know, the, the, the people working, working as executioners and, and so on and so forth would have to do after the execution. They would, they would clean the body. And um, Socrates is taking that upon himself because he doesn't want anybody else to have to do it for him when he's dead. So he has this kind of, this, this kind of strange calmness about the whole thing. So that's, that's one example that we've already seen. Um, but it also shows up in the Republic um, where the, the soul is kind of stretching itself up to the perspective of the divine. Um, you see a similar image in uh, Theotetus, um, where um, Plato describes the, the philosopher as kind of achieving a kind of a glance from above or a, a kind of overview effect, um, a, a, a larger perspective, a perspective that's not just the perspective of an individual ego, but some, some kind of larger self that has some kind of... Um, uh, a deeper sense for the whole, a deeper sense for the whole that it's a part of. Um, and then he also talks about it in uh, the symposium as, as kind of uh, beholding the, the image of, of eternal beauty. So he's circling these different examples of death practices, practices of death, whether it's death of the body, um, sort of death of the individual passions, a kind of ascent to a divine or a spiritual world, or uh, uh, just a beholding of a visionary uh, experience, um, which, like I said at the start, I, I also equate to a kind of a psychedelic vision or a psychedelic experience. Um, and what these practices all have in common is that they, kind, they decenter the individual person or they kind of strip it away, almost leading to its death, um, so that the, the ego identity is kind of pulled apart. Um, and so death in this sense can be a literal death, but it can also be this kind of philosophical or visionary or spiritual death. Um, but what in, in every case, you get this kind of liberation of the soul from the small self or the small ego. So for Hado, um, philosophy then is this kind of learning to die. It's a learning to die through these spiritual exercises. Um, and he describes these exercises as a, a kind of a tearing away from everyday life. It's a conversion or a transformation. It's a, um, a transmogrification of one's vision that changes one's lifestyle and behavior. The old person dies and a new person um, comes forth. Um, and so this is, this is kind of the image of philosophy practiced rightly that, that Socrates is aiming at. Um, but of course, in our contemporary scene, when we think of philosophy, it's easy to think of this um, sort of academic, uh, scholastic exercise that's, it's all, it's a lot about concepts and discourse and reason and arguments and logic, um, things of that nature. And of course, it is all of those things. Those things are all an important part of philosophy. Um, but philosophy in the sense that we're talking about here um, can't be reduced to questions about knowledge or knowing. And so there's this other famous philosophical injunction to know thyself, right? Probably most people have heard this phrase, know thyself, noti seo tan. And in another famous dialogue, the Apology, Socrates is said to be wise because he's the one who knows he isn't wise. And so in that dialogue, he says, I do not think I know what I do not know. And so even though he's kind of affirming his lack of knowing, the fulcrum is still knowledge, right? Knowledge, knowing versus not knowing. Um, and that's kind of the image that we've inherited of philosophy, that it's really about knowledge. But in this text, the Phaedo, uh, knowledge isn't necessarily the most important fact about philosophy. And this is the other thing that Socrates is trying to say in this quote about practicing it correctly. And so in the Phaedo and in, in other dialogues, uh, the really important thing is caring, caring for yourself, not knowing yourself, but caring for yourself. Epimelia heoto. Uh, Socrates even goes so far as to say that those who don't care for their own souls are in terrible danger. And so that if you neglect yourself, if you don't care for your own soul, 
you won't accomplish anything. You can't live the philosophical life and you can't, you can't gain the kinds of philosophical insights that you're probably after as a philosopher. You're, you're, you're in pursuit of wisdom. You're a lover of wisdom. And that means care. That means knowledge and care. Um, so from the perspective of practice, this, this phrase, know thyself, has to be met with this equally important phrase, care for thyself. And this is what I think ascesis, um, especially when aimed at the question and mystery of death, suggests. Uh, practice is a kind of, it's a kind of knowing caring, like a knowing hyphen caring, or it's like a, a caring that's also a knowing or a knowing that's also a caring simultaneously. To know is to care, to care is to know. And all of this is done in service of death, uh, which is viewed in this light as, as a moment of falling away, as a revealing, as, as an opportunity for seeing through a new kind of being. So I think then that the practice of death as a kind of meditative exercise aimed at conversion, transformation, preparation, uh, is at bottom uh, a kind of caring. It's a mode of caring attention, a caring and deliberate attention aimed at the self, but also at the other. We take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. And we try to learn about ourselves so we can better take care of ourselves. We try to learn about other people so we can get, we can better take care of them. So these practices, our philosophical practices, our contemplative practices really if we're doing them in the way that Socrates suggests in this dialogue, they're geared towards training for preparation for these moments of catastrophe, transformation, death, rebirth, falling away. Um, and then being ready for these moments is then one meaning of practicing philosophy in the proper way. So that when such events arise, our training comes into play. So we're something like philosophical or contemplative athletes. We're people who maintain our sense of care and lucidity, even in these times of death. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, there's a lot more that I want to say and could say, but um, I'll leave it there and uh, we can maybe have, have a little discussion, maybe 20, 30 minutes. I don't know, what do you think, Peter? Yeah, let's, um, let's field some questions and see where it goes. Uh, so if you have any questions for Adam, just write it in the chat box. I'll read it on your behalf unless you indicate otherwise. Um, and I'll, I'll warm you up with a, with a question or two, Adam. And maybe this will be a, a high level one. Um, Zach Stein was in the, the store earlier today and he was mm -hmm. talking about how we we're in this uh, liminal state. Um, he was talking about that article that he recently wrote for Emerge. Um, and sort of in this state, there's kind of like, we're seeing kind of different narratives kind of competing right now. Like, you know, we need mm -hmm. to go forward to something better or we need to go back to what was normal. Um, and when this whole situation uh, started occurring, this crisis or meta crisis, like usually I don't talk much about my stoicism. Like I'm kind of like a closet stoic most of the time, but it really just came online. And I'm like, okay, I had to really kind of, um, yeah. you know, turn this, to turn this part on. And it felt really important to do so. So the question for you is in this sort of liminal state that we're in, um, what do you think the role of philosophy is going to be or should be? And specifically the, the practice of death? Um, well, I, I mean, philosophy has a lot of different modes, obviously, and I'm kind of zeroing in on one. And it's, it's the one that I'm drawn to as a person um, in any situation, but it's also the one that I think is, is relevant right now. Um, and so this, this, this idea that we're in training, we're practicing, um, we're athletes of a certain kind of, uh, certain kind of contemplative athlete or something like that. The whole idea there is that you, you'll be response, sort of response able in the context of a situation that you can't predict, that you can't know. Um, the idea that we could build some kind of a system that will predict what next week will look like, what next month will look like, what next year will look like, seems right now more unlikely than ever. You know, it's prediction is a hard business anyway, system is a hard business anyway. But right now, um, having that kind of flexibility, having that kind of ability to navigate 
the unknown without needing to know what's about to come seems to be like the most important thing. So these, these practices, meditative practices, um, it, they ready you for unknown things. And so that, that's kind of how I relate to it. And um, the other question I had, uh, Massimo Piglucci, you know, the, the popular Stoic, he was one of the first oh, yeah. guests here in the Stoa. And he said something in kind of retrospect, I didn't, I didn't like that much. Um, he used the whole, you know, the, the arena metaphor, you know, the athlete metaphor um, mm -hmm. and, the, you know, Stoicism, like just training. Uh, and he kind of said, oh, yeah, it's too late now, though. We're in the arena. You know, it's too late to practice for it. Right. And people are going to turn to things like Stoicism or philosophy in these times. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think we should push them away. I wanted to throw that to you to see what you think. Yeah, I mean... Not to start uh, beef with you and Massimo. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've exchanged some messages before. Um, I mean, to a certain degree, I think the sense of what he's saying, there's something to the sense of what he's saying that um, if things are happening, you know, and so if, if you've already been practicing, that would be better. But it's never too late to start practicing. So... I don't really agree with the idea that you, you couldn't get something out of it right now. I think if you just, if today was abstractly just like day one, it'd be a great, great moment to start practicing. Yeah. I'm, I'm on team practice right now as well. <laughs> um, so Michael, I'm going to unmute you if you can read your question. You're unmuted, Michael. Thanks, Peter. Um, so Adam, I just wanted um, you to kind of give us um, an example of your daily practices um, of ascesis and, and kind of what that looks like, um, just so that we can kind of take something away that we can actually um, implement in our daily lives. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, well, you know, I think the main easy one is to just get yourself into um, just a, a regular practice just a meditative practice kind of how you know we opened up just with a minute or two of silence um, and just kind of be be with yourself in the silence and I've I've learned to let that silence be its own kind of teacher and to pay attention to what emerges in the silence um, and so not to come into it with a lot of expectations and um, and things like that, but to just just let let that intuitive side of yourself speak um, and and you know listen to it, and that's that's one thing that's been really helpful for me, um, especially these past few weeks. Um, but then there's other things, you know, like the, the the practices that we started about. Like I think I think if meditation is difficult for you, if philosoph philosophical texts aren't really your thing, then like. Um, like I've found like fasting to be like a really helpful tool to like clarify thoughts and emotions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another one that I, I do, you know, when we can go out into the world, um, martial arts has been a big practice for me. So I think, I think the number of practices are, are pretty diverse. Um, and it's, like I said, it's, it's hard to put them into words in a setting like this and just have them kind of land. But um, that, that kind of just like, just a, 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 a kind of a practice of, of, of Merton calls it contemplative prayer or mindfulness or, um, you know, just a, a regular sitting meditation um, and, and following where that thread kind of takes you would be the best right now. Cool. Um, okay. Let's go with Richard Tarnas. I'm going to unmute you. Hi, hi. I just unmuted myself. If that helps, cool. thanks, Peter, uh, and thank thank you uh, so much, Adam, uh, for your your timely thoughts. So I was just uh, asking, um, you know, you focused on Socrates, this uh, very well known uh, cheerful equilibrium as he faced his death, and you also brought up philosophical meditative experiences that in some way resemble psychedelic experiences. And I was wondering if you found any, if, if in thinking about this, you see any connection 
between Socrates' attitudes and, and the widespread participation in the Eleusinian mysteries in Athens at that time, as they uh, used some kind of psychoactive drink. Um, and of course, we know how you know, many people uh, who have psychedelic experiences undergo a, a, a really radical transformation mm -hmm. in their view of death and often over overcome that fear of death that they had previously been affected by, though often unconsciously. I just wondered if you had any thoughts, not, not that I'm asking you to, I don't know, reduce uh, Socrates's, um, you know, mm, equilibrium and, and kind of philosophical uh, contribution to, uh, to the Eleusinian mysteries, yeah. uh, but uh, just whether uh, you see any connection there at all, or have you thought about that at all? Yeah, um, I've, I've thought about it uh, quite a bit. Um, I know others like uh, Michael Pollan digs into the scholarship a little bit in his, his newest book on psychedelics. And I think, um, I think his name is Bill Richards has a book called Sacred Knowledge, where he kind of, they, they're both kind of go examining the evidence for psychedelic use um, in the Ellicinian mystery rites, um, mm -hmm. mostly in a, a beverage called kaikion, right? Which mm -hmm. is a kind of like a psychedelic, sounds like almost like a kind of a psychedelic beer, like a, like a real, um, some kind of a brew. Um, I, th I think that the, the connections are there. Um, I think that even some of the scholarship points in that direction, I don't think that's the I don't think that's yet the mainstream view in like this, the historical scholarship. Um, I find it convincing, but I also find it convincing because once you're on the other side of those other psychedelic experiences, uh, a, a dialogue like the Phaedo um, just makes a lot more sense. And some of the things that they talk about in terms of, of, of recollection or anamnesis and things like that make, just make a lot more sense. And so I, I, I have a hard time. I think you could probably, you probably can get, into those spaces without the psychedelic use. But um, at this point, I would be extremely surprised to learn that this, the psychedelic use wasn't a part of Socrates' initiation into these ideas and perspectives. Um, they certainly have been for me, um, and I, I, I bet they were for him too. Thanks, that's very much my, my thoughts as well. Cool. Um, Key, you had a question. If you can unmute yourself, yeah. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, thank you, Adam, for uh, speaking about your both your experience and the different types of practices that can be done to understand a bit better the process of death and dying in how uh, Socrates experienced it. Um, this is definitely, I'm also very new to Stoicism. So mm -hmm. hearing from your perspective um, helped me understand more about the, well, the, the texts for sure. My question revolves around when you talked about the knowing yourself um, and know thyself, and then when you related it to uh, caring for thyself mm -hmm. and the knowing caring um, dichotomy, I guess what I wrote is exactly what I wanted to ask. How would you differentiate doing this practice, this caring for thyself, this knowing thyself, um, doing this practice for preparing for the philosophy of, let's say, life and living? versus the philosophy of death and dying. And I put it that way because mm -hmm. the only um, background that I have in philosophy has been uh, reading uh, Anne Rand's book uh, on objectivism, mm. uh, so which is a different sort of perspective on uh, caring for thyself, being sort of selfish in that way, which I, don't, I know that that's a completely different school from Stoicism, but I was curious how you would differentiate the two. Well, I think... Yeah, so it's pretty pretty different schools of philosophy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's actually related. Your question is related to the question Peter started us off with. 
um, which is like, what is what does practice prepare us for? And I think if you're what I said at the beginning of the essay or the, the, the little talk was just just this idea that there's there's a we think of epistemology like the study of knowledge what we can know as exclusively this issue of like concepts and reasons and arguments and propositional statements and things like that um, but but the older view and I think the more correct view is that the epistemological questions are actually bound up in these in these kinds of moral and psychological dispositions so like you can actually get to know something better through caring right so ca caring gives you a certain kind of access or a certain kind of perspective on things that just knowledge alone doesn't get and i think that so, so like caring is a kind of, I, I don't want to call it a strategy because it, it just, it sounds too calculated, but in a way caring is, it's a kind of an epistemic mode. Um, and so if you're trying to understand things and you're trying to orient yourself in terms of what to do, say what action to take, um, caring is one of the ways to understand. So I think that's, I mean, and that you can think about any number of situations in your life where that would be the case. Um, so <clears throat> it's not a hugely complete answer, but that's kind of how I think about it. Cool. All right. Um, boop, boop, boop. Let's go with Sam. Sam, if you can unmute yourself. Great. Hi. Uh, Adam, I was pleasant to bump into you uh, here on the STOA uh, the other day when Jim Rutt was giving his talk. Um, and so Jim Rutt's involved in the whole Game B discourse, uh, as you know. Um, and I, I actually mentioned to you in private chat uh, how much I've been thinking about your taking up of this idea of a thesis uh, and how relevant it is to this Game B discourse that's emerging. Yeah. Um, you, you, we see a lot of forms of it, like uh, but what Benita Roy is doing with uh, collective insight practices and mm -hmm. it's being articulated with just collective intelligence in general. So initially, uh, I was sort of sitting with, with the question that I wanted to ask, which is, you know, what role do you think a species has to play in this larger bifurcation point that Game B is looking at uh, between the like the likely event of civilizational collapse versus uh, a transformation that's needed, but I, my, my my question's actually transformed a little bit because I'm also wondering if you share this observation that um, all these forms of what could be called a species or a discursive ethic that's rooted in a kind of disposition that's open to these forms of death. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems to be emerge, uh, showing up as an emergent phenomenon of these conditions as something that's necessary to facilitate uh, the kind of transformation that we need. And yeah. so I'm wondering, do, do you share that observation? Do you agree? And if so, why do you think that that would be showing up as an emergent phenomenon? Yeah, uh, a lot of good questions there. Um, if, if folks don't know what Sam's talking about, Game B is this term that uh, folks like Jim Rutt, um, Benita Roy, and um, others have started to use to distinguish, um, distinguish their kind of uh, civilization building exercise from what they call game A, which is basically what we live in right now. Game A is um, competitive instrumental reason, uh, war of all against all. Game B is non-rivalrous sort of non-zero-sum kind of community-oriented living. Um, I don't know too much about Game B. I know even less about economics, and I'm, I'm honestly kind of happy that I don't know anything about economics because it seems like a real mess to try and figure out. But uh, yeah, I think uh, Benita and I have had conversations along these lines that um, this, this whole idea of moving, moving back to practice seems like a kind of a game B move um, because, um, well, if you just look at what we've been talking about, we're, we're moving back to practice, but we're also moving away from um, using intellect and reason um, not in the mode of 
instrumental calculative manipulation and exploitation. So we're, we're moving the faculty of reason in a different direction through practice. And I think if ascesis has anything to do with game B, it's, it's something like that because you can't have a, a, a sort of a game B world without, without a different sensibility and without a different sense of what, what reason is and what it's for. So I, I, that's a short answer to something we could talk about for much longer. Cool. Uh, Travis, would you like to read your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Adam. Um, you mentioned at the beginning how Fado notes that he feels this strange mixture of pain and pleasure when uh, he thinks about Socrates dying, he's sad to lose his friend, but he's happy at the fortitude and preparation that Socrates presents in the face of death. And then a little bit uh, later in the dialogue, Socrates uses that very same phrasing, this strange mixture of pain and pleasure. Mm. And he's talking about how his legs feel when they take the shackles off of his legs, that as yeah. the pain leaves, he feels, he feels the pleasure as a kind of contrast. Right. And I think this, this definitely connects to the argument from opposites that somebody mentioned in a question above. Mm -hmm. um, and I note here that's a little bit like Freud saying, you stick, you know, you stick your leg out from under the, the bed sheets and it's cold and you pull it back in. And, you know, this is kind of what constitutes our pleasure. And so I'm just struck right now and how uh, everyday life's preciousness is really coming to the forefront of all our, uh, our consciousnesses. And we're feeling, feeling everything very differently in the yeah. aura of pandemic and death. And so I'm just wondering, yeah, how we could engage our practices in this moment to, to really in, internalize this and, and to carry it forward. And that perhaps even on the other side of this, if things are much better, we can uh, maintain that, that sense of preciousness. Yeah. I've been, I've been thinking a lot about, I get this relates also to the question of what, what use is philosophy in a moment like this? Or what use, even worse, what use are philosophers in a moment like this? Um, and, you know, I think about what, what can we do, you know? May, th the most important thing it seems like for me to do to help the situation right now is to stay indoors and to stay, stay away from other people, you know? But for other people, for nurses and doctors and delivery people and uh, trash collectors and, you know, I was just reading about um, there's a there's a group of um, uh, the people running the energy grid in New York who are now completely isolated so that they can stay healthy so they can keep the grid running. You know, so I think about all of these people that um, really matter, you know, like really matter and who we owe who we owe a debt to right now and who we will owe a debt to after this. Um, and what can we do? And I think one thing we can do is, is, is make better sense of the situation, put, put some kind of pressure into the discourse, uh, like in this direction of care. Um, we've seen just, just insane headlines about, you know, like hospitals who won't let their nursing staff wear uh, protective gear because it'll scare, it'll, it'll scare the customers coming in, you know, it's just like, what is this attitude, you know? I, I, I'm not a nurse, I'm not an electrician, I can't do those things, but I can, I can, push, I can push conversations in directions, I can push, put pressure in ways. And so I think just, just in that sense of like, um, what can we do? Uh, I, I think about those things and that's, so that's like, if, if we have any, if, if philosophers really do have any of this kind of lucidity about us, we, sh we should be able to, to kind of push in directions that 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 help and so that's that's kind of how i think about it it's sort of a i don't know an assistant to the process thanks adam well someone just wrote steal the culture <laughs> um uh todd would you like to read your question if you still have a desire to ask it <clears throat> uh yeah yeah and travis just mentioned part of it so uh yeah, Adam, it's good to see you again. Um, oh, hey, Todd. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I was smiling when I saw you there. I said, oh, there's only four people on this thing. And then I saw, oh, there's like 30-some-odd 30, 30 people. 
so the uh, in the Phaedo Socrates, he says, well, what are we going to do with the rest of the day before they give me the poison? Let's just think if we can chase away this fear of death. And he came up with the three arguments. Opposites come from opposites, mm -hmm. which Travis mentioned. So death comes from life. Therefore, life must come after death. And the second one was knowledge is recollection. Yep. Because he said, for example, when you see two things that are almost perfectly equal, how is it that you knew they were almost perfectly equal? Because you've never perceived it with your physical bodily sense organs, anything that's two things that are perfectly the same. So you must have been born with that knowledge because you could not have learned it after you were born. And if you were born with that knowledge, you must have had it before you were born. Mm -hmm. These archetypal ideas. Yeah. And he said, and I just quoted in there because it's a strong statement where he says, basically, if you don't have the one, these eternal absolute ideas, then there is no such thing as a soul. Mm -hmm. And if there's no soul, then there's no such thing as these absolute eternal standards by which we judge the relative and imperfect physical things. So what do you think about that argument? The archetypal ideas and the soul, either they both exist or neither one exists. Uh, I, <clears throat> this this kind of gets back to the, the, the question Rick was asking. I, I think these, these arguments have to be supplemented with experiences and the experiences I think are very convincing and the arguments are convincing after you've had the experiences. And I'm not sure if I would find them so convincing without the experiences, you know, it sounds, it, I, I, I just don't know, but I found, I find the perspective convincing on the basis of experience, but, I don't, I don't know what those arguments would read like if I didn't have those experiences, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. Kind of like philosophy seemed boring and not pertinent. Then you have a few major psychedelic experiences and then you say, oh, that's what they were talking about. That. Yeah, or the other and, way around, you know. I think that's how it worked for me, kind of. Yeah, or yeah, or mutually. Anyway, I was just wondering that argument if it seemed convincing, because it kind of. I think even Socrates says neither. None of these arguments are really convincing, but we have to do the best we can, like strapping a raft together, and that's <laughs> yeah. what he. Some I think it's in this, and then and we'll hold on to it, you know, and make the best of it. And here's my here's the best I've got. Right. That's all I've got. Cool. Um, all right, so we might have, uh, this might be the last question. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Nate, if you can um, unmute yourself and ask Adam your question. Hi. Hi, Adam. Hi, Nate. CV has been helping me to see the ways in which I thought I was ready to die, but was to some extent fooling myself, maybe to a large extent. As a result, I've been meditating on how close death is to life, even if I usually pretend that it's far away, and how the way I orient myself towards death isn't separate from how I orient myself towards life. Does that bring anything up for you? How would Socrates, Plato, or the Stoics speak to that? Yeah, it does. I, I relate to this question in the same way that um, uh, the Socratic tradition sort of relates to the question of knowledge and wisdom. You know, I know, I know that I don't know, or I'm, I, I don't know what I don't know, but I'm at least aware of my ignorance. And I feel similarly about this kind of readiness for death. Um, even if you kind of engage in these practices and, and meditate and, and focus on sort of non-attachment and um, dissolution of the ego and things like that, um, it's, it's aspirational. <laughs> Um, certainly for me, uh, I, it, it's, it's a practice in that sense, something that you have to keep doing over and over again. And that's not something that I don't think that it happens and you have it and it's there forever. I think you have to continually engage in the practice. And so in that sense, it's, it's, um, it's ongoing. It's a process. Thank you. All right, so this will be the, the last question. Um, 
Alexander Winter. Oh, I, I, it was just more of a comment uh, rather than a question, but I think to add to what was said about what can philosophers do, I think there's this sense of we can, we, we are so empowered by technology right now that we can tap into networks. And I think one of the big problems that people are, are dealing with right now uh, beyond the, the question of death is what is truth, you know? Everyone's scrambling for finding out what's going on with the virus. How can people stay safe? How can people be protected? How do we make sure that what's going to happen in the near to far future is, you know, the, the best course of action that we can take collectively? And I think that's the strength of philosophers is to analyze uh, in conjunction with, you know, science. I mean, which yeah. is really the child of philosophy uh, to find out what what is, how do we make more light of the world? How do we understand better what's happening? And then use that knowledge and make it actionable by building systems. Like I've seen many people, you know, put together spreadsheets, put together mechanisms of sharing knowledge that really do help. Um, and one example would be something I just saw today. It's a group from the Czech Republic or Czechia uh, called masksforall.org. Mm, where yep. the discourse has now shifted toward the recommendation is everyone should be wearing masks yeah. because that has kept the spread very, very low in the Czech Republic compared to other countries. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm with you on all of that. And I think that's why um, you need the knowledge, knowledge, truth, and reason side is, is still there. You just need to supplement with the, the caring, the caring intuitive side as well. Um, right. But yeah, I'm with you. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things that um, philosophers should be able to do is, is evaluate truth claims, um, the epistemic conditions of those claims, how those claims function in the discourse, how those, you know, all that sort of stuff that, um, you know, you, you're, you're trained in, to do in a university. That's, that's all extremely, extremely relevant right now too. And, and, and with that, I think also the, the providing of visions, you know, yeah. that, sort of constructing future futures in our heads conceptually that other people yeah. can latch on to. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's, that's the sense I get from like the game B crowd that we were talking about earlier is that they're, they're kind of speculative philosophers. Um, speculative, not meaning like, um, you know, just anything goes just kind of fantasy imagination, but that seeing into a possible future, you know, so just kind of like, through the imagination, creating a possible world that we could aim towards. Um, so yeah, definitely. All right, so we're gonna end it here. Uh, and in a moment, I'll do some kind of closing announcements, but uh, Adam, do you have any closing thoughts for the, the group? Uh, no, this was, this was just a great experience and I'm happy and thankful to share this space with all of you and uh, yeah. Stay, stay healthy, stay well. Cool. Cool. All right. Thanks my friend for coming in today. That was a treat. Uh, we'll post this on YouTube too, so you can send it out to, um, you know, on Twitter and whatnot. Um, so next event, uh, yeah, is in, is in a half hour in this room. It's an existential dance party. Adam was the war <laughs> warm up act talking about that. <laughs> uh, so just imagine a bunch of people in, in their zoom channels is dancing and, and Colin Morris from the Zion 2.0 podcast is going to do some guided movements so it's the same link of the rsvp is closed registration is closed the same link if you want to jump on in a half hour um that being said i view the stoa as a, a gift for anyone to freely use in this time of need if you're inspired to provide a gift to the stoa uh, just go to the stoa.ca and i will uh, put that in the chat and then at the bottom of the page there's information about the gift economy there and also do uh, sign up to the mailing list for for more events in the future all right Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Peter. Take care, everyone.